Welcome to the International Forum for Sustainable Asia and the Pacific 2021, organized by the Institute for Global Environmental Strategies. We are pleased to begin the thematic session, a hydrogen-based society, can Japan promote green hydrogen production in Asia? My name is Nandakumar Janadhanan. I'm a research manager at the Climate and Energy Division of IGES. Today, I'm joined by a panel of well-known experts in the field of energy and hydrogen. Mr. Keisuke Sadamori from the International Energy Agency, Dr. Eiji Ohira from the New Energy and Industrial Technology Development Organization, NIDO, Dr. Dolph Gielen from the International Renewable Energy Agency, Dr. Kentaro Tamura from IGES, Mr. Hideyuki Mori from IGES. Thank you all for joining for the session. The session will be 60 minutes long. Now let's start the session. I would like to invite our first speaker, Mr. Keisuke Sadamori. Mr. Sadamori is serving as a Director of Energy Markets and Security at the International Energy Agency since 2012. Formerly, Mr. Sadamori served in the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry and in the Cabinet of the Prime Minister of Japan. Thank you so much for joining us. Over to you, Mr. Sadamori. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, would you show the slides? With, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the organizer, the IGS, for including the IEA in this event. Uh, next, please. <clears throat> the IEA uh, launched a landmark report, The Future of Hydrogen, at the request of the Japan, Japan's G20 presidency in 2019. Uh, the hydrogen had many cold starts in the past, but now momentum behind hydrogen is turning into real world action. For instance, when the IEA published the Future of Hydrogen report, only France, Japan, and Korea had a strategy in place for the use of hydrogen. Just two years later, 17 governments have released hydrogen strategies and more than 20 governments have publicly announced that they are working to. Industry is responding to this call for action. According to the Hydrogen Council, the industrial uh, sector has announced the 500 billion uh, US dollars in investments from now until 2030 in new hydrogen related projects. International cooperation and initiatives on hydrogen is mounting. But is the progress fast enough? Does it go in the right direction? Uh, this year, we published the first Global Hydrogen Review, which will be uh, published annually, tracking progress on the hydrogen space, and that will try to give an answer to these questions. Next, please. Hydrogen is already a major business. In 2020, the global hydrogen demand was around 90 million tons used in traditional applications such as feedstock for industrial processes and refining. The adoption of hydrogen in new application is quite minor, limited to road transport, accounting for around 0.02% of total hydrogen demand. IEA's uh, net zero by 2050 roadmap released in May shows that the hydrogen needs to play an important role in the transition to a net zero energy system. In the net zero pathway, hydrogen demand need to grow sixfold by 2050, and its use expands to new sectors like long distance transport, heavy duty trucks, shipping, and aviation. In heavy industries, such as iron and steel production, or power generation to balance grid and integrate more variable renewables. By 2050, hydrogen and hydrogen-based fuels should meet more than 10% of the final energy consumption from less than 0.1% today. Of course, hydrogen is not a silver bullet. It is one piece more of the puzzle that we need to put together to achieve net zero emissions, along with 
energy efficiency, renewables, electrification, CCUS, sustainable bioenergy, and many more. It should play a key role in sectors where the other low carbon alternatives are not available or will be very challenging to implement. Next, please. We need to produce hydrogen in a cleaner way. In 2020, almost all hydrogen was produced from unabated fossil fuels, resulting in close to 900 million tons of CO2 emission, and that's equivalent to the emission of Indonesia and the United Kingdom combined. The production of low carbon hydrogen was less than 1 million ton, so practically all coming from fossil fuels with CCUS. Contribution from uh, water electrolysis was very small. However, the good news is that the number of announced projects to, to produce low carbon hydrogen is growing at an impressive speed. The, if all announced projects currently under development are realized, by 2030, the annual production of low carbon hydrogen could reach more than 17 million tons. Many of these projects are at an advanced planning stage, but around a quarter of the project uh, growth, projected growth would come from projects that are at very early stages of development. So there is some uncertainty here. Regarding the routes of production, there's almost an even split between the electrolysis and the fossil fuels with CCUS. There are notable regional differences. Uh, focusing on the elect electrolytic, electrolytic hydrogen, which is the focus of uh, today's event, I understand, Europe is the largest market for electrolyzers, and it is expected to remain the largest market in the near term. On the back of the ambitious hydrogen strategies adopted by the EU and the United Kingdom. Australia has become a hotspot for the electrolysis projects with its potential to produce low carbon, a low cost and low carbon hydrogen to export to Asia like Japan and Korea. Currently, the Australia is home of some of the world's largest projects under development. Latin America and Middle East are also expected to deploy large amounts of capacity, in particular for exporting hydrogen and ammonia. China made a slow start, but the number of projects is growing rapidly, with most of them announced last year. So that hints to a repetition of what happened in the solar PV. Next, please. The success of the projects will depend on the development of the global hydrogen market. So countries with a growing hydrogen demand, but with limited potential for low carbon hydrogen production can import hydrogen and hydrogen-based fuels from countries with good renewable resources or a large CO2 storage potential. Some governments have started to explore these opportunity with Japan as the front runner. We have recently witnessed three major uh, milestones. So in 2020, the first shipment of a liquid organic hydrogen carrier took place between Brunei and Japan. Also in 2020, 40 tons of ammonia produced from fossil fuels with CCS in Saudi Arabia were shipped to Japan for their use as a fuel. And finally, the first shipment of liquefied hydrogen between Australia and Japan is expected to happen before March 2022. Currently, Around 60 projects for exporting hydrogen-based fuels have been announced, with at least 17 of them already under development. These projects are heavily concentrated in the Asia-Pacific region, although some developments are also taking place in Europe, North, North Africa, or the Latin America. We think that the Japan has a key role to play. The country has already undertaken several major actions. Japan was the first mover in the use of hydrogen in transport with uh, 5,600 5, uh, fuel cell uh, electric vehicles on the road in April 2021. Japan is the fourth largest market in the world and has an ambitious target to deploy 800,000 
FCEVs by 2030. Japan has also targeted the use of ammonia as a fuel for shipping and for coal firing in coal fired power plants. We estimate that the ammonia demand for fuel applications can increase from none, zero today, to 3 million tons in 2030. In addition, Japan has recently launched $3 billion innovation program for demonstrating the use of low carbon hydrogen in aviation, shipping, steel making, ammonia production, and CO2 utilization. So for Japan to meet its climate targets, two thirds of the low carbon hydrogen based fuels demand in Japan need to be met by imports from regions such as Australia, Middle East, Chile, and Southeast Asia. There are still barriers that will need to be addressed, such as the development of infrastructure and the adoption of uh, international standards and the certification schemes to ensure that the hydrogen production is truly uh, low carbon. So thank you for your attention. And I look forward to the uh, very productive discussion over this very important topic. Thank you. Back to the chair. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sadamari. It was uh, an extremely informative presentation. And uh, thank you so much for highlighting the pivotal role hydrogen uh, can play in the net zero uh, targets. And also, uh, you have also highlighted the importance of how the uh, hydrogen trade is going to happen, how it is happening already in, Jap in the Asia Pacific region and how it is going to uh, progress. So thank you so much. Uh, and now we will move on to the next session where we would request our panelists to make a five minutes brief introductory remarks. And uh, there would be a, a bell would be ringing at the end of 4.5 minutes. And to, just to alert you that <laughs> there is a time limit. And now uh, we have three panelists. First of all, let me invite uh, Dr. Ohira Eji. Uh, Dr. Ohira is uh, uh, the Director General of the Fuel Cell and Hydrogen Technology Office at the New Energy and Industrial Technology Development Organization, NIDO, in Japan. Dr. Ohira is a well-known expert in the field of hydrogen technology. Uh, it's an invaluable opportunity for us to have you with us, uh, Dr. Ohira. The floor is yours. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Jair. And good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dejo Ohira. I'm a representative for the operating in the hydrogen fuel cell of the program. It's a great pleasure and for me to join this IGS workshop today. Well, and expectation for the hydrogen and increasing in worldwide. There are policy commitment on the world and a huge investment move to this area. Why hydrogen? I would like to start with current situation in Japan. When Japan had renewable energy is increasing every year, in the 2019, it reached about 10% of total energy or 20% of total electricity. However, our energy is still highly dependent on fossil fuel. From the perspective of improving energy self-sufficiency and combating the climate change, it's necessary to further expand renewable energies. On the other hand, Carbon, di carbon dioxide or CO2 emissions from the energy transformation sectors for many power generation account for just about 40% of the total energy related CO2 emissions. To realize carbon neutrality, we need to promote decarbonization not only power sector, but also the other sectors such as transportation, thermal, industry heat. And the hydrogen will be the most promising option to realize carbon neutrality. It not emit carbon dioxide or utilization, it will be produced from the various source, including renewables. Well, and Japan has been continuing effort to promote hydrogen through research development activities. NEDO as a government organization to promote national R&D project has been working on the R&D for hydrogen fuels over the 40, 40 years. A result from our program, we have have succeeded to launch world first commercial fuel cell application, uh, which is uh, uh, to residential fuel cell or any farm. The total number of the any farm installation has count over the 410,000 units. 
There's over 160 hydrogen feeding station, 6.500 and <clears throat> 6,500 fuel cell vehicle. A 100 fuel cell dominant bus has been running regularly mainly in the Tokyo city area. Recently, we strongly promoting the hydrogen scaling gap, which we try to integrate hydrogen into energy system to develop and enhance hydrogen demand. And our program has the many remarkable progress. And uh, we have developed the hydrogen filled gas turbine, small but uh, world first liquefied hydrogen tanker or carrier ship at commission this year. Prior to gas facility with a 10 megawatt single unit water electricity was launched last year and the hydrogen produced at the facility delivered to Tokyo 2020 Olympic Paralympic Games. To accelerate this hydrogen scaling gap activity, we decide to invest over 3 billion US dollars at, uh, for uh, 10 years around the activities. Uh, not only promoting the R&D activity in Japan, we, but we also recognize to enhance and strengthen international collaboration. We, Japan has hosted the Hydrogen Energy Ministerial Meeting since 2018, which is international platform to develop the momentum to promote hydrogen. A lot of the high level policy maker, including the Asian region, has kindly participated in the meeting. And one of the remarkable outcome is Tokyo statement, which contains area to be collaborated internationally, such as the harmonization of regulation code and the standard, public outreach activities, education, and so on. I believe there are many opportunities to promote well, <clears throat> Uh, international uh, collaboration between Japan and Asian countries. It's difficult to identify the collaboration area now. However, uh, I'm very willing to working with Asian friends who are uh, passionate to promote hydrogen specified area to cooperation. Well, <clears throat> and uh, I'd like to finish my presentation and again, expectation for the hydrogen have been luckily going up we can talk that the hydrogen with reality situation is changing in the past five years. However, I'd like to stress that uh, we need to recognize it takes a long time for the energy transition. Uh, we need to continue the challenges. The keeping passion and motivation must be the key for long-term challenge. I'd like to be happy to share this mind with you and move forward to realize, realizing the carbon neutrality with hydrogen. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Ohida. And it has been an extremely interesting uh, uh, remark is on hydrogen technology and how hydrogen has been uh, being promoted and how hydrogen technology is being promoted in Japan. And uh, it's especially interesting to see that how Japan is building collaboration with other Asian countries in, in terms of uh, hydrogen technology and uh, further uh, engagement on the hydrogen sector. Thank you so much. We have uh, some questions, which I'll save it for the panel discussion, uh, which is following. Now, let me request the next speaker, Dr. Dolph Gielen. Uh, Dr. Gielen uh, is the Director for Innovation and Technology at the International Renewable Energy Agency, IRINA. He has more than 25 years of experience with energy transition strategy development and implementation, as well as technology policy. Thank you, Dr. Galen, for joining us. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, um, hydrogen has a key role to play in the energy transition. The IRENA one and a half degree pathway was launched in March as part of the World Energy Transitions Outlook. And uh, we concluded that in order to uh, decarbonize global energy supply and demand by mid-century, uh, we need a lot of renewable power and we need direct and indirect electrification of the end-use sectors, buildings, industry, and transport. And when I say indirect electrification, 
I mean, the use of green hydrogen produced from renewable power and the use of green hydrogen derivatives, such as ammonia, renewable methanol, green steel, and synthetic jet fuels to replace fossil fuels. If we foresee a growth to around 620 million tons of clean hydrogen by 2050, which is a five-fold increase from today's level. Two thirds would be green and one third blue hydrogen. Hydrogen would account for 12% of final energy demand in 2050. The supply implications of such transition are significant. The amount of electricity needed to produce the green hydrogen equals today's total electricity production. But all that electricity needs to be renewable. Today, we have less than one gigawatt of electrolyzer capacity in operation. This needs to rise to more than 5,000 gigawatts. We need cheap green hydrogen production costs below one and a half dollars per kilo. And to get there, we need lots of cheap renewable power below two cents per kilowatt hour and cheap electrolyzers. IRENA works with its 180 member countries and private sector players to translate this vision into a reality. The collaborative framework on green hydrogen plays a key role in that context. And together with the World Economic Forum, we have recently launched a roadmap that shows the key enabling measures that are needed to be put in place by governments for green hydrogen deployment. And uh, there is the, the, one of the first applications of these roadmaps was for Japan. So I encourage you to have a look there. Uh, we see a key role for Asia in the development of the global uh, hydrogen economy. The region will continue to have a profound and growing influence on the trade and consumption of energy as it does for energy today. In particular, we see that Japan is one of the leading countries in the development of hydrogen uh, technologies. There's an interesting opportunity in electrolyzer manufacturing, as I mentioned, that needs to uh, ramp up significantly. Uh, together with the governments of Denmark, Germany, and uh, Chile, we uh, prepared a green hydrogen compact catalog for the COP, uh, and that uh, adds up to 130 gigawatts of electrolyzer capacity by 2030. So non-government uh, commitments to, to uh, realize that. So uh, we see a need for a global certification scheme to track the CO2 impacts of, of hydrogen uh, that is being traded. And Asian countries will benefit from participating in these discussions and providing inputs to the standards that need to be put in place for these markets. Uh, we see interesting opportunities, especially in large industrial users and hard to abate uh, sectors where uh, Asia is also a, a key uh, consumer. In the transport sector, we see a shift in attention from road transport more towards aviation and uh, shipping applications. Uh, we uh, look also at trade. We think that uh, around a a third of all hydrogen will be traded globally by uh, 2050, half pipeline based, half uh, shipped with a dominant, dominant role for ammonia uh, trade. And we will release a report on that early next year, as well as a report on the geopolitics of uh, such uh, of the role of hydrogen in energy transition, which of course is also very relevant in an, an Asian context. Uh, we looked in, into more detail into renewable methanol uh, produced from green hydrogen, and uh, we are working on a report on renewable ammonia together with the Ammonia Energy Association. So uh, industrial applications are key, uh, as I mentioned, uh, ammonia, steel production, and uh, you could import also these commodities into Japan, uh, Korea, and China, and, and India as well as import of uh, synthetic jet fuel and, and renewable methanol for shipping and aviation, respectively. So uh, I invite you to have a look at, at these, uh, these uh, IRENA analysis and also to look at the proceedings of the collaborative framework on green hydrogen. That concludes my remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Galen, for uh, making the presentation and especially pointing out the growth trajectory of hydrogen and 
uh, one of the most important element which I noticed in your presentation is about the importance you highlighted uh, regarding the electrolyzer capacity. That's something sort of very important. And um, thank you also for highlighting, uh, mentioning about private, private sector's role and what potential role private sector can play in this regard. And uh, regarding the point on geopolitics, uh, we have some questions which we are saving for the session and the, the panel discussions, and I'm looking forward to listening to that. In the meantime, I, you have also mentioned about the report which you are preparing currently. So we look forward to having that report or seeing that report uh, soon. Now, let me move to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Kentaro Tamra. Dr. Tamra is a program director at the Climate and Energy Division at IGES. Uh, he leads the climate energy research at IGES, and he has centered his research on international cooperation on climate change, in particular, the development and design of international climate regime, political economy, and comparative studies of domestic climate and energy policy making processes in major economy. Uh, over to you, Dr. Kendara Tambra. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. And yeah, I, uh, I'm, I uh, requested to make a statement on the Japan's net zero strategy and the role of hydrogen. So there are three policy documents uh, which provide Japan's approach to about 2050 carbon neutrality. The first strategic or basic energy plan, green growth strategy, and long-term strategy under the Paris Agreement. By overviewing these three documents, uh, you can find five key pillars for carbon neutrality in Japan. First, they, these document emphasize uh, thorough energy conservation and uh, efficiency improvement. Second, they stress the importance of decarbonizing power sector by exploring all technical options. I mean, maximum use of renewable energy is seen as a, a top priority. And also, Simon, uh, they suggest decarbonizing a thermal power plant by carbon capture and utilization and storage, CCUS, and also hydrogen and ammonia co-firing, or 100% firing. In addition, some have con contradictory, but uh, they state continuous use of nuclear power at the necess necessary scale and uh, develop new generation of new reactors while reducing dependence on the nuclear as much as possible. The third pillar is electrification in all sectors. For example, wide deployment electric heat pump in residential, and commercial, and industrial sectors uh, envisioned, and also electrification of road transport is another emphasis of this, this document. And fourthly, the promotion of hydrogen-related technology is also emphasis. So hydrogen is expected to apply for the hard to abet sector, that means hard to electrify sector, such as high temperature heat in the industrial sector, steel making, aviation and shipping, and so on. And five, as a five, uh, fifth pillar, uh, direct air capture and storage, ducts, and also bio, bioenergy with carbon capture and the storage, the BEX, and also re, uh, reforestation are uh, mentioned for offsetting uh, residual, residual emissions. So by looking at this document, you can find that the hydrogen and the fuel ammonia are expected to play key role in two areas. One is decarbonization of the power, uh, summer power generation, and second is hard to electrify or hard to abet uh, sectors. I think the strong emphasis on hydrogen and ammonia for power sector is somehow unique to Japan. The hydrogen ammonia firing technology are seen as a key for the decarbonizing existing thermal power plant. 
So ammonia is a compound of nitrogen and hydrogen, and initially seen as a hydrogen carrier. Since compared with hydrogen, ammonia is much easier to handle and transport. But it became clear that the ammonia can also directly use as a fuel, and burning ammonia doesn't emit CO2. So existing coal fire plant can significantly reduce their CO2 emission through retrofitting with ammonia co-firing technology if carbon-free ammonia is available. Then ammonia content will be gradually uh, increasing to the 100% by 2050. Uh, similarly, gas-fired power plant can also be decarbonized by blending carbon-free hydrogen with natural gas in conventional gas turbine and then gradually increasing the hydrogen content to 100% over time. So I think these are kind of key uh, feature of Japan's approach uh, to uh, the carbon neutrality and also its role of hydrogen uh, in that uh, strategy. Uh, that is, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Tamura, for highlighting uh, Japan's net zero strategy and role of hydrogen. These are uh, self-explanatory points, so I'm not going to going deep into that. But thank you so much for your comments. And uh, now let me move to the next session of this uh, 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 this event, which is Q&A &A session. We have some questions here which we have planned, and we would like to uh, ask our panelists these questions. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, ask this question to Dr. A.G. Ohira. Could you explain about, is there any technological feasibility or what, to what extent is the technological feasibility Japan has to pursue its plans for building a hydrogen society in Asia? Well, <clears throat> Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. It's quite important, but, uh, and uh, it's very difficult to uh, some sort of very difficult question. But uh, and, uh, simply, uh, the answer is yes, we can. But uh, however, the method I uh, need to to <clears throat> carefully examine. You know, on transforming the technology, just transforming technology is not enough. The technology will need to be root and uh, spread. For this reason, it's necessary to involve the, the local uh, companies, local university, and uh, there is a uh, prayer of technology spreading out. And uh, we also need to consider whether the technology is really necessary for the country. Uh, for this reason, the roadmap of each country is quite important. By showing in a solid direction, and uh, technological development can be promoted efficiently. <clears throat> we um, also think uh, that the resources uh, can be effectively allocated, showing in the important fields. It takes time to, to put hydrogen to practical use, but the uh, technological development should be promoted for long-term perspective. And again, and uh, we we can uh, the, <coughs> get feasibility, technological feasibility uh, for the, in in the Asian region. We are uh, happy uh, to to collaborate, better to realize the technology in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ohida. Now let me uh, ask a question to uh, Dr. Galen. To what extent? To what extent green hydrogen as a clean fuel is getting attention in the global market? And how do you assess its trajectory in the coming decades in the global market? Yeah, so, so the, um, the attention is, is clearly growing, but, but as I said before, it, it's, it's, a bit, um, it's a bit shifting because of technology innovation. So, uh, a couple of years ago, we were talking mainly about uh, uh, hydrogen as a fuel in, in road transport. And there we've seen significant progress in, in, in battery technology. So it seems to be going more electric. 
both uh, the cars, uh, the delivery vans, and also increasing the discussion around heavy duty trucks is, is, is moving in that direction. But there is this new markets emerging. So uh, there is now uh, new policies coming for aviation sector. And there is a, a lot of developments now of, of e-fuels uh, for aviation with fairly standardized uh, uh, technology. And then that is then hydrogen derived uh, fuels. And uh, it's a similar uh, trend in, uh, in shipping. So uh, both ammonia and methanol, and, and then also e-methanol e uh, is being, uh, uh, is receiving a lot of attention and we see also that shift happening. So, uh, and, and the volumes can be very significant. So, so uh, much, uh, uh, much larger than today's uh, volumes of, of, of ammonia and methanol production if you move into energy. Uh, so, so we see these as key markets in, in terms of adding hydrogen to, uh, to, to natural gas uh, uh, grids. That is, let's say, an area where there's different opinions. Uh, there is, in, in, for example, in Europe, uh, some attention to shifting completely from natural gas to, to, to hydrogen in certain systems. But I think the jury is still a little bit out if that will happen on, on, on a massive scale. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gillen, for that uh, for response. Now, let me move to the next question, to the third panelist, Dr. Kendaro Tamura. Dr. Tamra, how far Japan considers hydrogen, especially green, blue, and gray, to play an active role in its net zero targets? You have already highlighted some aspects, but what specific information would you like to share now? Okay, yeah, I just focus on the, this uh, green and blue and gray. Yeah, to, of course, to, to contribute to the achievement of uh, carbon neutrality, hydrogen or ammonia should be green or oh, not blue. Uh, but for the time being, uh, I think it's, yeah, Japan seems to start with gray hydrogen. That means the byproduct gas from uh, industry sector uh, to establish uh, inf infrastructure and also infrastructure. That's, that's for, for a time, uh, short time period. But after that, by 2030 and 2040, uh, they are more focused on the developing the international supply chain of the overseas uh, green and blue, uh, blue and green hydrogen. But since the cost of green hydrogen is more expensive than the blue hydrogen at uh, present, so initial uh, production of low carbon hydrogen is likely to be mainly the blue. However, the recent uh, life cycle assessment find that uh, blue hydrogen from natural gas combined with CCS and also blue ammonia from uh, lignite uh, combine, uh, combined with CCS emit uh, almost as the same as um, amount of uh, greenhouse gas as conventional uh, thermal power plant. So therefore the blue hydrogen uh, can possibly uh, spearhead the initial development of a supply chain at the scale, but need to be replaced by green hydrogen later. So it is expected that uh, so green hydrogen could compete on the cost with fossil fuel alternative by 2030 or afterward uh, due to the further cost reduction of renewable energy and uh, technical in improvement and also scale of uh, electrolyzer. So the government, I think policy uh, need to avoid uh, locking uh, with blue hydrogen and also to promote uh, R&D for green hydrogen production. Uh, that uh, I think are uh, necessary. And also uh, Japanese government is looking for that direction. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tamira, for uh, uh, sharing your response. Now, uh, let me move to the second round of questions. And uh, this in this, I would again like to go to uh, Dr. A.G. Ohira. 
Uh, in your view, what kind of roadmap do you see for establishing a hydrogen society in Asia as envisioned by Japan? As the discussion uh, uh, is always on uh, around the hydrogen society and uh, we have actually been hearing about hydrogen society quite a lot from Japan. So we would like to hear your view on this. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for the question. As I mentioned earlier, it's a national roadmap is quite important uh, to, to promote, to, to accelerate, and to realizing the hydrogen society. But uh, the first of all, I'd like to mention uh, that roadmap is the difference uh, depending on the circumstance of each country. For example, in 2014, about seven years ago, Japan, we Japan first formulated a roadmap for the hydrogen and the fuel cell. And this aim to realize hydrogen-based society in three-step, kind of step-by-step -step approaches. And then step one and steady is spread of fuel cell application, like a fuel cell vehicle and a fuel cell, a stationary fuel cells. And step two is introduction of the hydrogen power generation for or who <clears throat> develop and uh, enhancing the hydrogen demand, and also introducing the international hydrogen supply chain around the 2030. Uh, step three is uh, introduction of uh, carbon dioxide free hydrogen, including the renewable hydrogen under 2040. Well, and um, the background is Japan is a world leader in developing the fuel cell products. We launched the fuel cell application in 2029, of the stationary fuel cell in 29 and the fuel cell vehicle in 2014. In addition, we Japan has a very few natural resources, even in renewables, and it's necessary to import resources from overseas for industry activities. As a roadmap is formulated based on the our situation, but on the other hand, Asian countries got very different environment from Japan. And there's a possibility of exporting the hydrogen based, based on the abundant renewable energy because uh, so there are many uh, Asian countries who have rich renewable resources. Well, uh, I mean, there has been various roadmap, and but uh, I suppose we can share and approaches for developing roadmap. We would like to, to contribute to the development of the roadmap of each country, Asian countries, by sharing our experiences. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ohira, for uh, that response. In fact, uh, it's really important to understand uh, what kind of possible roadmap we can have. And uh, incidentally, uh, today we have uh, IGS has developed one discussion paper uh, on hydrogen, and uh, we will share that with you all. Uh, it is uh, just a discussion paper which will, uh, which is aimed at uh, fac facilitating this discussion. And in that, we have tried to identify some possible mechanisms for collaboration. So thank you so much for highlighting uh, your views. And uh, now let me move to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Galen. I have a question to you. What are the most crucial economic and geopolitical factors that influence the development of hydrogen value chain in the world and why? So uh, if, if we talk about uh, uh, green hydrogen, uh, it's still uh, considerably more expensive than, than gray hydrogen. And uh, the uh, cost of renewable electricity is a critical component. So we, we need renewable electricity at one or two cents per kilowatt hour. And uh, you, you find these low costs um, in remote locations with good renewable resources. So uh, you want to tap into these, these resources. There's great interest worldwide. But of course, um, that is a bit balanced by the transportation cost. So the work that's ongoing in Japan to reduce transportation cost is, is really important to, to make that vision uh, a reality. 
Uh, in, in, in general terms, uh, green hydrogen is, I would say, more secure than, uh, than uh, uh, oil or gas as, as an energy source because the resource is more widely spread. So, so uh, you can diversify your, your uh, supply. Uh, if we talk uh, uh, blue hydrogen uh, produced from natural gas, then basically you're, you're, you still have that dependence on, on the major uh, gas uh, suppliers. So um, it, it, it's, it's a bit different for different uh, types of, uh, of hydrogen. And so in, in terms of the, the, the uh, value chain, there's also great interest to, to move down in the, in the value chain into ammonia, into uh, production of iron or, or, or uh, aviation fuels that offers interesting opportunities in, in, in the supply countries. Again, it also increases the potential to tap into remote renewables uh, resources but for the time being it's 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 critical that there is some kind of demand security so either that there are policies in place that that mandate the use of uh, clean or green hydrogen or the, or its derivatives uh, or that there is indeed uh, uh, companies that step up and say well we, we really just want to buy uh, uh, clean or green uh, fuels. So, because that that will then also increase the the uh, confidence of financiers, and and will lower the cost of capital and and, and make it these these uh, investments feasible. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gillen. And uh, now let me move to uh, Dr. Kendara Tamra. Uh, Dr. Tamra, to what extent Japan's basic strategy targets to promote green hydrogen? You have already mentioned about how Japan wants to uh, progress from dependence on gray hydrogen and then in 2030 to blue and green hydrogen. But how far actually Japan has a clear plan now with regarding, uh, regard to green hydrogen now? Yeah, thank you very much. I think, um... As uh, Dr. Ohira already uh, pointed out, uh, due to some uh, limited domestic uh, production capacity, Japan is exploring uh, green hydrogen import uh, through establishing international hydrogen supply chains. But uh, as to the hydrogen, uh, currently less than 2 million tons are supplied domestically uh, by, by, by product gas from the oil refinery or steel making and uh, petrochemical processes. Then now the Japanese government set the target of supplying 3 million tons by hydrogen by 2030. In case of fuel ammonia, if all coal fire power plant in Japan were turned into 20% coal firing of, of ammonia, a 20 million ton of ammonia is required annually. This amount is equivalent to the amount of current global ammonia trade. So we can see it is clearly uh, critically important for scaling up the production of the hydrogen and ammonia. So, but uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, due to cost concern, uh, most of Japan's uh, overseas uh, project of hydrogen production are blue hydrogen now. But there are several concerns about uh, its environmental uh, integrity. So it is important to make uh, green hydrogen competitive. So how green hydrogen become competitive? As a previous speakers already uh, pointed out, it is important to reduce cost of uh, electrolyzer and also improve the electrolyzer efficiency and, most imp and also importantly, uh, reduce cost of renewable uh, electricity. And this is an area, these are areas where Japan can cooperate with green hydrogen exporting countries. So I think this is uh, critically important uh, to Japan to find a more you know, relevant way to cooperate uh, with uh, you know, uh, the future uh, hydrogen exporting country. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Dr. Tamira, uh, for that response. Now, uh, since that uh, questions to the panelists are over, I would actually like to take up one of the questions we received from the Q&A. Uh, one question we have got from uh, one uh, Mr. David Nagige. And uh, if I could request uh, Mr. Keisuke Sadamori, uh, your view on this question. Uh, this question is about, can green hydrogen fuel be embraced by the third world countries? Or basically, he's trying to ask that how far developing countries, uh, de development of hydrogen is possible for the developing countries? Because we all understand that hydrogen is a technology intensive and cost intensive uh, fuel as of as per now. So what is your view on this? Uh, thank you. Uh, I think that is a very uh, good and relevant question. And if we take a look at uh, the, the, the global uh, picture and uh, try to find uh, the which country or the which region have uh, good uh, renewable, uh, the kind of cheap uh, renewable uh, resources. It's basically around the, the, the around the equators and where the uh, many of the developing uh, countries are located. So in that respect, they have a very good potential uh, to produce the low carbon hydrogen. But of course, uh, that requires uh, the substantial amount of uh, the technology transfers and the capacity building for those countries. But if uh, the, we undertake the international cooperation, I think that there's a very good chance that uh, the developing uh, world uh, can, can benefit uh, from this huge potential of hydrogen as the low carbon fuel necessary for the clean energy transitions. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sadamuri. And this question is open to uh, any of the panelists that in your view, how far uh, is uh, developing countries equipped to, de uh, to develop hydrogen? So maybe the three of the panelists who are there, I would like to request if one of you like to respond quickly on to this question. Yeah, yes, uh, Dr. Galen. I mean, we, we, we get almost daily requests from uh, developing countries that are interested to uh, develop an, an export industry uh, for hydrogen. Uh, that includes uh, a lot of countries in, in Asia, in Latin America, uh, so, uh, and of course also in, 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 in the Middle East. Um, but it's still very much that export focus. Uh, and and uh, of course, there is a market for for uh, ammonia uh, in these countries for fertilizer. Uh, and for example, uh, uh, Morocco is 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 thinking about ammonia in the context of a more diversified um, uh, fertilizer export industry. Um, but but the the um, the use of of hydrogen as a substitute of for natural gas in developing countries is still a relatively new thing, uh, and uh, it will also depend that that uh, again on that factor that we bring down the cost uh, quickly. But we are optimistic that in the next uh, five years we will see the cost reductions that will make it an attractive option. Thank you, Dr. Galen, for that answer. And uh, I'm, I'm, my apologies, in, in the interest of time, I'll have to wind up the session now. And uh, let me uh, thank all the panelists. And then now let me request uh, Mr. Uh, Hideyuki Mori, uh, our special policy advisor of IGES, to uh, join me in, uh, uh, in delivering in this, uh, this concluding remark. Mr. Mori has an illustrious career during which he held important positions with organizations including Asian Development Bank, United uh, Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, Ministry of Environment, and the Global Environment Facility at the United Nations Environment Program. Uh, Mr. Mori, over to you. Oh, thank you very much. Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. 
thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, all of you are making very informative presentations and uh, very interesting discussions amongst you. Uh, it's really uh, interesting. I fully enjoy uh, the discussions you have today. Uh, other world is um, uh, gearing towards net zero. Uh, it is important that clean energy technologies gain significant attention from policymakers, not only policymakers, but from industry and other stakeholders. Uh, the deliberations are held here today, and the important questions raised by the facilitator and others uh, are really fascinating information about the development of new hyd uh, of green hydrogen in the world. The deliberations uh, also highlighted uh, several research opportunities to further study the role of hydrogen in carbon neutral world. While Japan may be able to uh, make substantial progress on hydrogen technology, collaboration uh, with other countries, including perhaps uh, developed, developing countries in the region is crucial as well. In this regard, I believe that co-innovation of hydrogen technologies uh, will be a very useful uh, approach. Co-innovation is collaborative and uh, iterative approach to jointly innovative, uh, innovate technologies that play a crucial role in uh, uh, carbon uh, neutral world. Delegates, again, once again, uh, thank you very much uh, for your uh, innovative uh, contributions, interesting contribution to these deliberations. I hope um, uh, we will further strengthen our communication amongst us on this important uh, topic of hydrogen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Murray. And uh, let me once again thank all the panelists, Mr. Keisuke Sadamuri, Dr. A.G. Ohira, Dr. Golf, uh, Dolph Galen, Dr. Kendaro Tamura, and uh, Mr. Hideyuki Mori. Thank you so much for joining us.